Compared to the vast majority of other modern-day animals, the evolution of equids is one that is seemingly better known to the public, at least at first glance. In most textbooks, and in some documentaries, you'll often see modern-day equids at the very front. At the very back, you'll either see a genus known as Eohippus or a genus Cyphropus, or inaccurately Hyracotherium, and then three or four other genera which at first might seem like it makes up the entire family of Equidae. However, this is a very misleading and oversimplified view of Equid evolution, excluding hundreds of known species and dozens of genera, and one or more subfamilies and tribes. These latter views of evolution will usually show all four lower metacarpals transitioning into a hoof, an increased amount of comet on the teeth, and an increase in the size of the general animal. Before we get into the main portion of this video, I just want to say that this is inaccurate for a few reasons. The form of evolution shown in these graphs is known as anagenesis, where one species will evolve directly into another. Because this view doesn't actually show a family tree, it removes much of the diversity within a single family, giving a very false impression. In this video, we will be looking at the very early evolution of equids, from their origins to about 30 million years ago. First off, before we look at the family Equidae, I want to briefly discuss the other family within the clade Hippomorpha, known as Paleotheridae. Both the Paleotheres and Equids are a part of the superfamily Equidia. And the two families shared a last common ancestor around 55.8 million years ago, during the very late Paleocene Epoch. The very first and possibly most basal genus within the family was the genus Hyracotherium, containing just one species, Hyracotherium leporinum. In many of the graphs I mentioned earlier, you might notice that it's this genus, representing the very first member of Equidae. However, this is false, due to the recent distinction between the two families. Interestingly, H. leporinum was once not considered to be the only species within Hyracotherium proper, with H. vulioceps and H. sandrae also once being clumped within the genus. However, all those other species within the genus have now been assigned other genera, separated by anatomical differences. Another genus within the family Paleotheridae, living 55.8 million years ago, was the genus Propaleotherium, endemic to Eurasia. Similar to Hyracotherium, it was about the size of a domestic day cat, if not maybe a little bit larger. And instead of looking more like a horse, it possibly resembled more closely maybe a modern day tapir, except vastly smaller. Plagiolophus was another genus within the family Paleotheridae this time being almost solely known from Western Europe. Plagiolophus was also much larger than the previous two genera, reaching weights of up to 150 kilograms, reaching a size rivaling some modern-day ponies. According to a certain 2009 study that I referenced below, looking at the dental wear of the genus, the diet of these animals did not change for the first 300,000 years after the Grand Kapoor, roughly 33.9 million years ago. This diet would have mostly consisted of fruits, or abrasive plants. Being a survivor of the Grand Kapoor, Plagiolophus also outlasted the family's namesake, Paleotherium. Being discovered all the way back in 1782, it wasn't until 1798 that the animal was classified, being placed within the order Placoderms, which once contained horses. Unfortunately, this group is defunct, containing hippos, elephants, dugongs, cetaceans, and just a lot of very unrelated animals, all being shoved together into a single order. But this was eventually cleared up around the mid-19th century, with Paleotherium believed to be an equid, before it was eventually placed in its own family with the other genera. Paleotherium was another large genus, reaching up to 700 kilograms in the largest species, Paleotherium giganteum, with the smaller species, Paleotherium sidirolophicum, reaching only 61 kilograms. Paleotherium magnum, 
would have also lived alongside the genus Anoplotherium, which was a part of a completely extinct family within Artiodactyla. Paleotherium didn't last that long after the Grand Kapoor in the grand scheme of things, going extinct roughly 32.5 million years ago, during the early Oligocene epoch. Now that we've looked at Paleotheridae, the most appropriate thing to do afterwards is look at the family Equidae, and the very early evolution of the family. The first recognised member of Equidae to appear in the fossil record 55.8 million years ago was the genus Eohippus. A possibly synonymous genus, and possibly older genus, is known as Cyphropus, containing the species Cyphropus sandrae. Cyphropus lived in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming, possibly coexisting with, and even being synonymous with, Eohippus. Two such forms from Europe around this time were Orohippus and Pliolophus. Both genera are a part of a subfamily known as Propaleotherinae, which likely doesn't actually include Propaleotherium as you probably know by now. Next to appear was the genus Ephohippus, believed to have evolved from Orohippus, with the species appearing 46.2 million years ago and surviving to about 38 million years ago. Haplohippus also appeared at this time, 42 million years ago to 38 million years ago, living in the Calrano Formation in what is today East Central Oregon. Though each of these genera are relatively significant in terms of being from North America and Europe, showing a very early concentration of early equids around these areas, few of them were truly a part of the lineage leading up to modern-day equids. That all changes 37 million years ago in the Middle Eocene Epoch, with the arrival of the genus Mesohippus, a part of the important subfamily Ancotherinae. Ancotherinae is likely a paraphyletic or incomplete grouping of equids, likely being the lineage that gave rise to modern-day horses. Mesohippus was the very first fully tridactyl horse, with the third digit being longer and larger than the second and fourth digits, though it still hadn't had quite developed a hoof, which would be seen in later equids. One of the sub-branches within the subfamily Ancotherinae was the genus Archaeohippus, containing several species, living from 30.8 to 13.6 million years ago. The dentition of this animal seemed to be kind of a transition from more basal teeth to more modern and advanced teeth, similar to those in the genus Parahippus. The ancestor of modern-day equids within Ancotherinae was likely Myohippus, living from the late Eocene to the late Oligocene, from 32 to 25 million years ago. Myohippus was larger than Mesohippus at around 40 to 55 kilograms, being nearly twice the size of Mesohippus, but it was still vastly smaller than modern-day equids. After Myohippus came Parahippus, and now we move on and end with the formation of the subfamily Equinae. And both tribes within Equinae have been discussed thoroughly in the two videos I've linked below. To conclude our peek into the evolution of modern-day equids, it's important to stress just how much we know, at least about this particular family. To Along with equids, all other prosodactyls like rhinos and tapirs have very good, clearly defined transitions in the fossil record. This is different to, say, Cyrenians, like manatees and dugongs, which are very poorly known from the fossil record, and as such, there are so many blanks to be filled in. Next episode, we will be looking at the family Calicotheridae, which are those strange horse, gorilla, panda hybrids. Anyway. I'll see you then. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Owen, leave a comment. Bye.